any secrets of the Mao Mao, this oath will kill me. If I am called in the night and refuse to come, this oath will kill me. If I see anyone steal white man's property, I must help him. I must hide what he gives me and say nothing, or this oath will kill me. The whole system in this country, the economic system, is such that uh, jobs are scarce. Automation is limiting jobs. It's, it's, it's decreasing jobs. And uh, if autom as automation eliminates the job opportunities, legislation will not create job opportunities. All it will do is bring about friction and hostility between the two races. You, you see, there will be no uh, progressive revival if black uh, folks are not deeply involved in it. I will obey all orders of the Mao Mao, or this oath will kill me. Good evening, good afternoon, and to some good morning, welcome to another episode of the Mao Mao Hour with the Pascal Robert, let me bring in the man of the Mau Mau Hour. Please welcome Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings to Jason Miles. As you guys see, the number is on the screen. Um, this will go live for everyone in about an hour or so. So the phone lines are closed after 6 p.m. Pacific time. That's 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. They will be closed. This is a patrons only call in uh, and response. So the patrons that are here, Pascal, will pretty much be talking to you uh live time because you can see the chat on the screen let me even bring it up so everybody can see and we have our favorite moderator that is screening the calls m2 song so this is going to be a good one and i will move out of the way for pascal robert greetings friends comrades and enemies this mile mile hour is going to be a subject that within the traditional spectrum of black political thought and black social thought can be kind of controversial we're going to be talking about a subject that has literally become so contentious in elements of black political history that people got killed over it, assassinated. People actually conspired with American intelligence agencies over disagreements regarding this. Uh, this has caused profound, profound, profound anger, uh, and breaking of comradely bonds over time. And the subject matter we're going to talk about today is Black cultural nationalism. Now, for those who do not know, cultural nationalism is not simply relegated to Black people. There's a broad type of cultural nationalism, which is basically defining a people or peoplehood by collective cultural, behavioral, or social phenomenon exclusively exclusive to simple race or ethnicity. So you can have Jewish cultural nationalism, you can have Irish cultural nationalism, you can have Flemish cultural na na nationalism. There are a variety of types of cultural nationalism. But today, we're going to talk specifically about Black cultural nationalism now to put black cultural nationalism in a proper perspective i would argue and i think many would agree some would disagree that black cultural nationalism 
is one of the various iterations of the phenomenon known as black nationalism. What is black nationalism? Black nationalism is a political philosophy and ideology. Now, there is an American context to black nationalism and black nationalist thought. I would argue, and I don't think anyone would disagree with this, that the concept of black nationalism in its origins is a post-transatlantic slave trade phenomenon. I'll make that argument. I'm willing to be challenged on that. Why would I make that argument? The reason why I would make the argument that black, na black nationalism is a post-transatlantic slave trade ideological phenomenon is that prior to Western or European content on the African continent, the means of identification amongst the African people was not projected within the actual dynamics of blackness. It was projected in the concept of clan, tribe, some people don't like the term tribe, or ethnicity. I am Wolof, I am Mandinka, I am Pule, I am Fulani, I am Hausa, I am Yoruba. You know, so understand that yes, even though there is there is a territory in Africa called Abaladu Sudan. Abaladu Sudan means the land of the blacks, but the people within that territory still did refer to themselves by their tribal or ethnic or clan identifications. So my argument is that the concept of blackness as an identifier of African diasporic people becomes projected politically as a consequence of the transatlantic slave trade. That doesn't mean that there are not times in history where African people are called black. Prior to contact with the Europeans, Arabs use the term black to refer to Habashi, Ethiopians or African people. The way it was utilized didn't have the same political or social consequences as it was in the Western or European transatlantic slave trade. So my position is that, yes, the term had been used before by some to refer to black people, but it doesn't take its full operational political salience until after the transatlantic slave trade. I would argue that the first place we actually see black nationalism operationalized in the Western hemisphere is in Haiti, particularly under Dessalines. Now, some would find it ironic as much as I am a fan of the Dessalinian project that I'm also not a romantic or fan of black nationalism. That's a that's a complicated thing to discuss at another time, and I will very very easily be able to explain that. The Dessalinian project was a project rooted in clear identification of blackness as a political identity. How do we know that? Because if you look at Jean-Jacques Dessalines' 1805 Constitution. He literally says, regardless of whatever your color is, on this island, all citizens are black. Whether you are biracial, mulatto, even a white Polish soldier who lived here, or a white woman, you are now black. So understand that that was a projection of identity in opposition to the normative expectation of whiteness that dominated the, West, the Western Hemisphere. That was an intentional projection of identity. So the question becomes, when does cultural nationalism be begin to play? I will make this other argument as well. Some may disagree, and I'm willing to be challenged. I would make the argument that the cult, that Black cultural nationalism or the argument that there is something unique about black 
or African descended culture that is worth politically, aesthetically, or socially valuing starts with a man who was the chief, uh, I would say, intellectual architect of one of the early leaders of the Republic of Haiti, who was Henri Christophe. Henri Christophe took up took over the northern portion of Haiti after the assassination of Dessalines. And the man I'm talking about is a man whose name is Baron de Vasté. Baron de Vasté. Pompey Valentin de Vasté. There's a very good book written by a contemporary, a current Haitian scholar named Maureen Doe, who teaches at University of Virginia, where she has a compendium of the work of Baron de Vasté. I have the book on Kindle, but if you want to look for the book, her last name is D-A-U-T. Her first name is Maureen or Marlene, but the last name is, and you look up his work. If you read the writings of Baron de Vatti, that's how you say it in French, he is basically a literary assassin to the notion of white supremacy. He's basically making arguments that not only are Black people worthy of being respected, he's basically writing that Black people are superior to white people, that we are better than you are, that there's nothing about you that deserves to be respected. You know, his pen is very sharp. You know, it, he, he's, he's considered by some to be the first Haitian historian. He's also one of the first Haitian scholars who talks about the African nature of, of Haitian cultural production and its value as well. All right, so I would say that in terms of the intellectual, in terms of the written pen, I would say, and some might disagree with me. Now, listen, I don't know everything. I'm willing to have people challenge me. I'm going to make the argument that I think that Baron de Vatti is the first manifestation of post transatlantic slave trade cultural nationalism. I would say that the next manifestation of cultural nationalism in the 19th century is also a Haitian manifestation, which is the empire of Faustin Souluk. Souluk was an emperor who runs Haiti from, I think, 1840s to 1850. This is before black nationalism, black nationalism even becomes an intellectual project in the United States. Salouk's whole project was embracing the voodoo culture. He made voodoo the religion of the state. He made voodoo a, a compendium of the value system of Haiti. So I would argue he was a cultural nationalist. We'll get to Delaney. Now, in terms of the American context, I would argue that black nationalism, if you read the good book by Wilson Jeremiah Moses, starts in 1850 as a reaction to the Fugitive Slave Act. What happens is that in 1850, as a consequence of the Fugitive Slave Act, basically free people of color in the North realize that if they are captured, they can be brought back to the South and put back in shackles. This causes an existential crisis amongst Black people, particularly free people of color in the North. And that is where you start to see the intellectual foundations of black nationalism in the United States. One of the reasons that I have a problem with black nationalism, even Dessalinian black nationalism, is that it is a politics of reaction. What do I mean by that? Black nationalism is a politics that is born as a reaction to fear, concern, and worry of white oppression. It is not something that organically develops on its own. It's an ideological project that is born in reaction. Okay? No one can deny that. That's a fact. You are, you are creating a black project to show something to someone. Who are you trying to show it to? To white people. That's a fact. By definition, 
the Black Nationalist Project is a vindicationist project. What does that mean? You are trying to prove yourself to white people. By definition. And if anyone knows me, what does Pascal dislike about black politics? The vindicationist nature of black politics. That black people have to prove something to white people. I find it very, very demeaning. I have a lot of other reasons why I have problems with black nationalism, but my larger point was to demonstrate that cultural nationalism is one of the intellectual subsections of black nationalism. So I just wanted to give you some historical background. Now, what are the different types of black nationalism? Again, some people will disagree with me here. I'm willing to accept that. Different types of black nationalism, classical black nationalism. The classical black nationalism, I would argue, is what you would call the Marcus Garvey, Nation of Islam type, pro-black capitalist, do it yourself, don't depend on the government, black man, pick yourself up, a lot of respectability politics, do it on your own, I like get mine, you know, build examples of black excellence you know, miles of civilization, so on and so forth. That type, that's one type of, I would call the classical black nationalism that comes out of the 1800s, but really starts to manifest itself with, uh, with Garvey as well. You see that in the NOI, so on and so forth. You have also, some people disagree with this, I don't. What I would call petite bourgeois black nationalism. What is petite bourgeois black nationalism? Petite bourgeois black nationalism is of the talented tenth black liberal collective racial uplift. We as a people must be uplifted by our educated elite so we can project success as a race. Again, some people will disagree with this. I really don't care. Black nationalism in the American context, because there's basically an inability to manifest it in a territorial logistic way. In other words, there's no state or land or property to manifest it, I would argue is more of an ideological project than a physical project, even though in its origins, land acquisition, whether in Africa or whether in Haiti, or even sometimes in the United States was part of the project. There are some intellectuals and scholars, one particularly who I disagree with, who believes that the only legitimate form of black nationalism is black nationalism that is wedded to a nation state or territorial project. There are some people who argue that. I think that is a very solipsistic or very narrow, one-dimensional picture of what black nationalism is. I think that you can have a concept in the American context of collective black political autonomy that does not require a nation state project that can manifest itself in black nationalism. Some will disagree with that. That's a fair debate to, to, to have. So petite bourgeois black nationalism, I would argue, is the kind of talented tenth racial optive collective liberal black nationalism that does not have a problem with working with whites or even socially integrating with whites but still believes in an organized dominion and control of the black political body by collective groups of elites both projects are an elite project classical black nationalism also wants a leadership class they don't want to integrate they don't want to work with white uh, uh, um, interracial coalitions, but they also want an elite leadership class. Petite bourgeois black nationalism wants a collective elite leadership class that is willing to integrate and work in interracial coalitions. And then the next we have 
is revolutionary black nationalism. Revolutionary black nationalism, contrary to what some people believe, they would say, oh, it starts with the 60s, with the past. No, I would argue that the first iteration of revolutionary black nationalism we see in America actually is older than the classical black nationalism we see in the 1850s. This is going to be a controversial call. Some people will disagree. I'm going to make that call. I think that David Walker's appeal, if you look, I don't know if you guys are familiar with David Walker, early 20th century, black, free, free person of color, who wrote a very radical revolutionary book taking telling black people to basically prepare to defend yourself for your freedom from your white oppressors called David Walker's Appeal. It is a, a black nationalist text, and I believe that it has a very revolutionary component. I will make the argument that David Walker's Appeal is the first iteration in North America of revolutionary black nationalism. And I would argue that his manifestation of revolutionary black nationalism predates the classical black nationalism that comes about after 1850. I've never heard anyone say that before in that way. And I really would like some actual scholars on black political thought to, 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 to challenge that. I'm willing to be challenged on these things. I'm not an expert. I'm a student of black political thought. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not an expert at these things. I would love people to challenge me if they, if they, if they will. So we have classical black nationalism, petite bourgeois black nationalism, revolutionary black nationalism, and the last, which is the subject of the show, is cultural black nationalism. Cultural black nationalism is about basically believing that the cultural nature of black people or African people should be embraced, should be celebrated, and should be at the forefront of black identity. Do you want me to play the clip? Sure. We're going to play a couple of clips to manifest some examples, more some comedic, some less comedic, of course. This is I only have the one, the and and I wasn't able to get the exact clip, uh, but it's the same thing about the slaps. Oh, that's not the one I wanted to see, but okay. Which, I'm sorry. Which one would you rather prefer? I wanted to see the one uh, from the Black Panther Party. Oh, but you texted me and you didn't email me. It's easy to find. Oh, hmm. want me to email it to you? It's too late. Keep talking. I'll find it. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So we have cultural. So we got classical black nationalism, petit bourgeois black nationalism, revolutionary black nationalism, and we have cultural black nationalism. Now, today's subject is about cultural black nationalism. I would argue my main problem with cultural black nationalism. Number one is it, it is also very much a vindicationist project, i.e., we got to prove our culture. And one of the reasons why I don't like cultural nationalism, there's a word in Creole which is like a piège. A piège is like a hole, a hole you fall into accidentally that takes you nowhere. For me, cultural nationalism has always been a piège, a deadbeat hole for Black people. And I'll tell you why. Because cultural nationalism coincides with a very toxic reality in the way in which particularly white liberals use their fetishization of Black exoticness to have Black people focus on their culture in terms of instead of the material condition basically what i'm saying is that when black people become cultural nationalists and become too enthralled with cultural nationalism they almost destine themselves to become some kind of entertainers of white people Oh, look at the interesting voodoo culture you guys create. That art is wonderful. Do you see the colors? Oh my God. You basically become the museum spectacle for whiteness. Instead of worrying about 
How come we don't have electricity, roads, weapons, nuclear or otherwise in Timbuktu? You get, oh, my brother, the art that we created before the white man was so amazing. Do you see the drums? That's why I find cultural nationalism to be a piège or a hole for black people. I, this subject matter comes as a product of a debate. A good friend of mine who is, I have never met physically, but we've been going back and forth on Facebook for over a decade. He's an anthropologist, British anthropologist, Muslim Afro Trini brother who forgot more about Africa than I probably may ever know. Brilliant brother. If you can find him on Facebook, go on YouTube. You can see his videos. His name is Dan Juma. Bihari, D-A-N-J-J-U-M-A-B-I-H-A-I-R, Danjuma Bihari. If you can find some of his videos, you should look him up. He is very radical, brother, has some, some Marxist tendencies, but he's a big-time cultural nationalist, big-time Pan-Africanist, lover of Black nationalism, deep brother. Very, I, I love this brother profoundly. He had put something on uh, Facebook, in a Facebook group that him and I are both on, basically talking about the importance of Black people in the diaspora, in the African continent, in the Caribbean, like in Haiti, maintaining their linguistic sovereignty in order to uh, combat psychological colonialism. In other words, maintain your tribal or ethnic languages and don't let your French or English dominate your mind and deny you from expressing your Africanity. Because he's a cultural nationalist. And I asked Dunjuma a question. This is a very, very controversial question. And I did it as a prov provoc prov provocation. I basically asked him, Dan Juma, what about the the uh, the people of Singapore adopting English to improve the development of their country? Wouldn't that be an example of an indigenous people using a Western language to empower themselves? And the person said, and Dan Juma said to me, he said. Choosing a Western language for development and having one forced upon you by empire is not, not the same. I said, okay, shrewd, shrewd, shrewd argument, shrewd argument. So that's how uh, the conversation started. And... Um, I'm actually uh, I'm looking for a video of Danjuma Bahari here, but I found one. This is a very good one that I will share with you guys so you can find out who he is. But I responded after, and Dan, Dan and I, I used to call him Geechee Dan. Geechee Dan, Danjuma and I have been friends for a long time. So I can joke with him and say this kind of stuff. He's not going to freak out. I just put a link to one of Danjuma's videos there. So this is what I said to Danjuma. Uh, in response to his response to me, which was that choosing a language is not the same as having it forced on it. I was very direct. I said, this is my, my quote. I find cultural nationalism among Negroes to be an intellectual graveyard of worthless posturing. Your quote unquote African culture didn't stop these Europeans from kicking your ass then, and it doesn't stop them from kicking your ass now. Maybe the problem is that you're actually too attached to the stuff as believing it's some kind of solution to your problems. Not saying to discard the African culture. Stop fetishizing the stuff because you suffer from a Fanonian, as in France Fanon, need to identify, to need for identity self-esteem boosters in front of the white man. The biggest joke about African, cult, African cultural fetishism among Negroes is that it is almost totally the province of college-educated Negroes in the diaspora. 
you ask a local villager in any black diaspora country, do you want that cultural symbol from your ancestors or an iPhone? That tribesman is going to say, Negro, give me that iPhone. I don't see China acting on the world stage worrying about being culturally colonized. Only defeated people use such rhetoric in the world. The Chinese are saying, I'll make my own damn iPhone. And if you think African culture alone is what allowed the Haitians to defeat the French, you're delusional. Don't discard African culture or your indigenous culture. Much of it is beautiful and even serves material importance. But stop fetishizing culture as a bulwark against modernization and the need for technical advancement and evolution. So that's what I said to Dan. And I like that comment so much, I emailed it to like about 5,000 people. I got no negative responses. I was like, wow, I'm impressed. I'm pretty impressed. So Did you that basically... Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, we are a half hour in. Jason, we got some videos queued up or no? Uh, the video you sent is two hours long, and well, I don't want to. I don't want people to watch. I just want people to know what it is, just to look at it, to oh, see. God. Okay, well, to know how to spell his name. Okay, well, I have the Kathleen Cleaver video. That's the one I want. This how about that. Okay. But we're born that like this, and we just wear like this because it's a natural. Because uh. The reason for it, you might say, is like a new awareness among black people that their own natural appearance, physical appearance, is beautiful and it's pleasing to them. For so many, many years, we were told that only white people were beautiful. Only straight hair, light eyes, light skin was beautiful. And so black women would try everything they could, straighten their hair, lighten their skin, to look as much like white women. But this has changed because black people are aware. And white people are aware of it too because white people now want uh, natural wigs. They want wigs like this. Did it? Isn't it beautiful? All right. <laughs> I love that video. That's an example of cultural nationalism. Oh, one thing I want to say, back to how people died. If you guys know the origins of the creator of Kwanzaa, Who? what's the name of the brother's name, Jason? Ron Karenga. Ron Karenga. The Ron snitch? Karenga allegedly, allegedly, uh, when his US movement was getting on, was getting into a major beef with the Panthers around the need to focus on cultural nationalism. Huey Newton used to call cultural nationalists pork chop nationalists because he believed that their attachment to all of this Africanity, divorced of understanding the particularities of the multitudes of African culture, was childish and ridiculous. And literally the debate got so heated that members of the Black Panther Party were assassinated, some say with the help of the state, over this disagreement. Now, in the wake of the period of time we have right now, Afrocentrics, Hoteps, and all that other stuff, I don't think some of, because we have a lot of leftists and Marxists here, people understand how hot and how incendiary challenging cultural nationalism amongst Black people are. And I was actually shocked after I put that response to Dan Juma up, I said to the people I know who are hardcore quote, cultural nationalists, no one disagreed. So on that note, that is my presentation for the Mau Mau Hour. Let's open up questions. Phone lines are open. The number's on the screen, 628-873-8658. If you have a question or a comment, feel free to call in. And Pascal will we'll take it on air. So, Jason, you have any thoughts about today's Mama Hour subject matter? Um, you know, I was reading uh, Cedric Johnson's book <clears throat> before the show, kind of right before the show, and also getting ready. He's coming on our show on uh, Tuesday. And, uh, you know, him taking a look at that, that essay, The Panthers Can't Save Us Now, um, I think it's a pretty important essay because I thought it was I, the most important political essay that came out the year it was written. 
what was that like 2017 i think yeah um it's like we're stuck in that era um i see more I, I, a few months ago i don't know if you remember i was sending you guys these things that were popping up on my on my social media feed it was because i think i had just done the the huey newton uh video essay mm-hmm. and you know because i had to get all that footage you know the algorithm says oh you must be interested in this i was surprised at how many companies make black panther merchandise hmm. so many and it's not marketed towards an older demographic it's for young people it is your cultural signifier it is your black and i'm proud bracelet correct if you thought yeah. african medallions were something in the late 80s early 90s i mean it's a whole nother world merchandising the idea of what people think the panthers are now let me tell you this is a deep deep and i, I want i want to be fair right i want to be really fair here because some you know i have friends who are friends who are actually admirers of the show in my work with like, pascal i love you man but you're so hard on black folk bro why are you so hard on black folk man I said, bro, man. I said, like, damn, man, you, you be hard on the brothers, man. I was like, yo, listen, man. I'm not hard on black people. I am hard on some black people, I'll be fair. I am hard on some black people. But there are certain ideas that black people have, I think in the contemporary moment, are worthy of being challenged. Because I want to say it, this is going to be very, some people are going to be like, damn, I can't believe you said it. I was like, if all this crap was so good and it worked, why are the white man kicking our ass still? If all of this stuff was so great, why are we still getting fucked over by Whitey? Well, hold on, uh, Whitey, fucker over E. We got some calls on your left. Wants to come in with some clarification. On your left, can you hear me? On your left, can you hear me? Oh, let's try it again. On your left, can you hear me? Pretty good. Um, can you guys hear him? I can't hear him. Hold on one second. That's so, weird. So, of course, there are dialectical material reasons as to why black people are in this condition. And I'm not saying that well, just because that stuff didn't work, we should throw it away. I'm not saying we should throw it away. But what I'm saying is that I find particularly people from my generation and younger, people who are born in the late 50s going down, we are attached to these figures, these people, these ideas, these these uh, political thoughts and philosophies. None of them really were the silver bullet, but yet the material nature. Okay, he's here now. On your left. Can hey, you can you guys hear me now? Yep, now we can. Okay, great. So um, I wanted to ask a kind of clarifying question to Pascal about some seeming contradictions in the way you articulate certain theses about kind of race relations. Um, and kind of the prompt for this question is I recently read, you know, The South by Adele Freed uh, Jr. And, um, you know, I thought what was really struck me about that was how there's so much, um, there's utility in knowing whether somebody's going to be racist to you, right? Of course. And, but the book really kind of clarifies, you know, that the arbitrariness and improvisational nature of that process over time, the rules can kind of become clear, but they're always improvised and they sort of become more settled. And I think one of the things about that book was how through the kind of sieve of time that becomes reduced into a very concrete, clear lens. So that's the context for, I think sometimes when you're talking, there's two things I'd like to kind of hear a clarification on is One is I think you often talk about white people in an underspecified way. I think some of it's polemic and it's quite funny sometimes. Um, but, you know, when you talk about black people trying to, you know, uh, impress white people, like which white people, right? And I think over time that the, the use of the word white there distorts more than it clarifies. And then the other thing I noticed that's related to that is you seem to still refer to black people as the collective we. It's just that you're expanding that universal we to include working class and poor black people. So I guess my question is, is there still utility in using kind of these notions of um, race in a modern context outside of just knowing who's likely to be the victim of racism in a certain context. And I can take my answer off there. Thank you. It's a very good question. I like that question. It's a very, very direct and, uh, you know, question. 
I I I uh, use we and us because I realize that in the context of the real politique of black thought, as much as I would like to collapse the notion of collective black I, ideological function as a political mass, I realize that that is not the pre- practical reality of how most black people view themselves relative to each other. So I am very cognizant of how racial collective uh, assumption of uh, assumption facilitates the politics of containment, no doubt about it. And my aspiration is to collapse that functionality and allow black people to choose their own path based on class and material uh, desires, interests, or material quality of life. But I also understand that the real politique of the black political condition is so divorced from that idea, idea and worldview that for me, rhetorically, and sometimes in my writing, I je- I try not to use black collective identity in my writing. Sometimes it's in, or sometimes my editors put it in the title. For example, I wrote a piece recently where someone put black community in the title. I normally would not do that. Well, but look, we got another call. We know time is of the essence. But I wanted to get to the second que- second part of his question, though. Okay. Okay. Um, I forgot the second part of his question. Oh man. Well, oh, which, which white people I'm talking about? I'm talking about the white people with power. Those white people. We have a new caller. This is Zoon Jones. Can you hear us? Hello. Oh. Do we lose him? Hello, June. Can you hear us? Hello? June, can you hear us? Hey, how's it going? Good. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Big fan, big fan of uh, Jason Pascal. Um, my question is for Pascal. Uh, Pascal, you mentioned how black na- cultural na- nationalism developed out of the oppression of, of African Americans. But my question is what nationalism developed on its own? Uh, it doesn't develop in a vacuum. I mean, I know. Wouldn't you agree with that? I mean, look at the Ukrainians right now. They have. I mean, they they basically. I mean, there could be challenges to Ukraine. What definition of the Ukraine is, and what uh, the country is, and whether it is a nationality or whether it is a country. But they're being forged. Right, it's being forged right now, and it's and it, it, it's. And I think the same. I mean, you can make that for you can make that argument for many, many, uh, many uh, na- na- nationalities and nations. It's a great question. Uh, do you have anything else you want to ask? Um. Oh, okay. Well, let me respond. Let me respond to that. Um, I absolutely agree that many oh. forms of nationalism are products of reaction to oppression. I would argue that many forms of nationalism are not. I don't think the British Empire was a nationalism that was developed out of literally reacting to oppression. I think it was a a nationalism that developed out of an imperial project. In other words, nationalism, and I would argue that this is the case with all nationalism, right? And I think Gene, Gene and I have had long conversations about this. I believe, and this is going to be controversial, I believe that all forms of nationalism, I don't care, black, white, Jewish, I believe all forms of nationalism are a elite ruling class project. The ideology of nationalism is not something that projects from the proletariat or the masses or the lumpen. It is those who are in the capacity to project a political project upon the masses who are usually either elites, maybe not in terms of classical education or professional managerial class or petite bourgeois, either through status, material wealth, uh, lineage, cultural ascendance. I would argue that the, the, the nationalist project across the board is an elite project. 
and worthy of suspicion off the cuff. Thank you very much, June, for your call. Thank you for your patronage. We have another call. Caller, can you hear me? Hello. Are you talking to me? Oh, I'm talking to you, caller. Can you tell us your name and where you're Are you talking from? to me? Yes, I am. This is Shirley. <laughs> Shirley. <laughs> Shirley. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Why are you playing with me, Jason? That's not nice. <laughs> All right. So I have a question, uh, Pascal. So one, this wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be because I really thought you were going to work my nerves. <laughs> However, my question is, why since like uh, the transatlantic slave trade and the emergence of cultural nationalism, why do you view it as something redemptive or having to prove something to white people as opposed to reclaiming what was stolen and ripped from us? That's a good question. That's a good question. Great. One. Great question, Shirley. Shirley, you're always coming with the fire questions. Thank you for your dedication to the show as well. Oh, yeah. She said she got another one for you. I will argue that um, the politics of redemption does not simply have to be about proving something to white people. And frankly, it never is. I would argue that the politics of redemption, redemption and racial vindicationalism always serve a dual purpose in terms of projecting a sense of self-assertion and esteem to whites and believing that black people are quote unquote broken and need to be repaired culturally with something to build their self-esteem. And I will argue, Shirley, that's always an elite project. It's not an accident to me that philosophical, philosophical ideas like double consciousness come out of elite educated black people. Mm -hmm. I don't think black people who were sharecroppers picking cotton in 1903 was worried about no double consciousness. You leave Du Bois out of this. You know? They may have, but they wouldn't have uh, framed it that way. Well, I don't think that they, they were worried about it because they were worried about how am I going to be able to get the money to feed my kids? What I'm saying yeah. is that I, I believe double that consciousness would have been Hear me out, Cheryl. I, sure. I believe that much of Black intellectual thought is reactive, particularly, this is going to be controversial as hell, it reflects the neuroses of petite bourgeois or Black elites in the face of the fact that they have to interact with whites in a more equal footing than proletarian blacks and their personal positionality as being negotiators of or, or ventriloquists for black identity causes a psychosis amongst themselves that has them dedicate so much of their intellectual project to this vindicationist goal. And you had another okay. question, Shirley? So, yes. Pascal, and I, I mean this sincerely because, you know, I really respect you, but do you think you may have a, you might be so a class traitor almost? Oh, yeah, your that's group? my goal. Absolutely. I, 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 embrace, I, I embrace that title. <laughs> I embrace that title. That, you know, okay, in, okay, in, okay. In leftist, in leftist speak, that's a good thing. Adolf Reed considers himself a class trader. Uh, Emil Cabral considers himself a tra class trader. Uh, uh, Fidel Castro considers himself a class trader. Nelson Mandela considers himself a yes, class trader. I'm talking about. I'm talking about among educated African American people. You, your critique is very harsh, which is okay. Um, but I mean, you just you just cut. You just cut, cut, cut all the time. Yeah, I'm you a ever trader, no doubt. To... Okay, okay. You might want to show a, a bit more grace sometimes. Ooh. Sometimes. This, no? yeah, by the way, have you been following my Twitter feed? Remember what I said? I've never heard working black people say, working class black people say, 
you too hard on the bougie folk. What do they always say? Tell me, tell me more. Who are the only people who tell me you too hard on the bougie black folk? It's always what bougie black folk. What you trying to say? About, what are you trying to say about me, Pascal? Just because I asked your question. You mean, <laughs> you mean free people of color descendant of Shirley on the phone? <laughs> Hey, that's right. Hey, how'd you know that? You talked about it on the show. Yeah. Well, thank you for your call, Shirley. We gotta we gotta take these other calls before our uh, our time is up. Thank you very much. Let's get the next call. Caller, where is your name? Where you calling from? Caller. What up, y'all? This is Dr. Claw. What Dr. up, Claw? From Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, I, hope, yeah, I, I had to call in for this one because this one. Dr. Claw, I hope you got some. This, one, this one really hit home. I hope you got some funk music in the background, bro. Yeah, make sure that I turn that stuff down. Can you hear me? No, we can hear you just fine, brother. All right, all right. <laughs> So, um, of course, uh, I really enjoy the show. I've been really enjoying the last few shows that you've been doing, particularly in and around this topic of cultural nationalism. Um, I think for me, it's been very beneficial to kind of articulate some of the issues I have with certain manifestations of uh, particularly Black cultural nationalism. But um, the show that I really enjoyed was the last one you guys did with uh, Corey Robin. Because mm. you guys, and particularly in the champagne room, because mm -hmm. y'all was dropping atomic bombs on the perception of Clarence Thomas mm -hmm. and what he actually is versus his perception. And I think this really ties into this topic because when y'all were describing him in his early days and coming into the um, into the path that his career path that he's gone through. Um, he sounds to me like, first of all, the, the revelation that he was a black cultural nationalist at one point is would blow people's minds. Because prior to that episode, I had typed something to the effect in somebody else's discord that he was the high priest coon emeritus. <laughs> and then hearing that about him was very, was very revelatory. Um, but one of the, I think the, the main uh, thing that I get from you, Pascal, and some other critics of black nationalism is that it often leads to reactionary politics. And I saw that with the way that you um, expressed, um, or at least seemed to express, I wish you guys, like, like Pascal, I wish you guys could talk about it for 12 more hours, <laughs> about Thomas in general. Right today, we're, uh, you know, there is a new... Um, hearings for a new Supreme Court yeah. justice um, and a uh, black woman. Mm -hmm. And um, the tenor of the reactions to that uh, process, which you know, to me just looks like a bunch of kabuki theater, to be honest, would you say that her confirmation is being sold to public in the ways of the talented Kent versus the, the black nationalist tradition that Clarence Thomas apparently comes from. And the, I, I got to say, the thing that really drove it home for me was looking at his rulings and some of the things that he, like the jurisprudence he actually follows, how it comes from that. Um, I find it very timely that you guys are about to look, you know, watch A Soldier's Story because I think that's a really great film to look at um, class division within um, Black people in the United States especially. Um, I, I, Adolf Caesar did a great job acting with Dr. Meyer. And so I really, I really, I really appreciate that movie. But it's very relevant to this moment and to, you know, the difference between Thomas and Jackson as far as, you know, judicial figures. So Pascal, what would be your comment about um, Thomas and versus Jackson in this tradition? Oh, man. First of all, Dr. Claude, let me tell you right now, brother. Yo, know, shout out to Dr. Claude. Shout out, first of all, Shout out to the This Is Revolution patrons. Y'all are, I think, some of the best patrons that exist out there. You guys are on and popping in the Discord 24-7, and your questions are incredible. Dr. Claw, you basically created the best, most viral clip of me. 
I, that has ever existed online that is still at the top of my Twitter timeline. Don't think I don't know who you are. Don't think I don't recognize your dedication to our project here. Shout out to Dr. Claw. I'm not surprised that it's a brother from Cleveland, the funk capital of America. And, you know, shout out to you. To answer your question, I think that you were very perceptive in saying that the Clarence Thomas project versus the the, uh, the Sister Brown Jackson project are two different manifestations of a black nationalism. One being the petite bourgeois, we all are uplifted by Sister Katanja Brown Jackson being on the court, child. I almost cried. Do you see that black woman answer those questions with such grace? But you had you had some good things to say about her a few weeks ago. I was I literally. Listen, listen, right listen, I'm going to lie, bro. And I'm going, you know, because you know, Jason, we talked about this. She's the most progressive and the best in terms of our politics, left politics. She's the best candidate we've seen on the Supreme Court in my lifetime. And I would argue in some ways she's better than, than, than Thurgood Marshall. Quite honestly, in terms of her dedication to uh uh criminal justice. Of a of a definitely progressive nature, I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna say something that might be controversial. I think she, might, I'm I'm worried that she might not get she might not get the appointment. I think they might reject her. There's a big right wing push against her that uh, you shared a clip recently of Lindsey Graham uh, losing his shit over Guantanamo Bay. Yeah, I'm actually I actually think they might actually give her the ding. But what is so, and I said this to a, one of my boys, what is so sad to me is that her nomination was poisoned by Biden turning it into a reductionist identity politics pick. Biden, I'm not mad that he picked a black woman. I, have no, I think, we, of course, we should have black women on the Supreme Court. Of course we should. I just wish that he didn't turn it into a political spectacle for his utility to game black votes and just simply said, I'll have a Supreme Court pick and I'll choose from a diverse candidacy. And then when he picked her, bam, this is my candidate. And then let black people like, oh, wow, he picked a progressive black woman. I believe that his bungling of that process delegitimized her as a candidate and reduces her as to this kind of symbolic trope of vindicationist, redemptive black politics that has black folks saying, child, I almost cried when they talked about her growing up in Miami. Like she's one of their family. You don't know who this woman is, man. How immature are you? What about the criticisms that she's another Kamala Harris? I don't think, oh, listen. I, 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 I am remiss to talk about that interracial marriage stuff. Clarence Thomas has been married to a white woman for years. I don't hear anyone calling him out for that. I mean, listen, man. Listen, I'm, I really find it, listen, I, I'm, yes, there are people who critique black men for marrying white women, but I really find it interesting how black women who marry white men get this kind of like extra special contempt, like she's a Negro bedwench kind of hatred. When, you know, black men have been marrying extra you know extra interracially for eons you know i'm really not i'm not cool cool listen are there black people who don't like to see interracial couples yes that's a fact that's a reality of black life are there black people who actually try to make legitimate arguments of why they make it they think it's problematic yes there are that's a fact that's the reality my position is i'm not going to judge a black woman as a woman for doing something that black men have been doing for over a century. Does that answer your question, Jason? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was also comments that she's not progressive enough. I was getting more into that. I, I, I'm sorry. I think on the fact we talked about it on the show. I think on the, on on the facts on their face prove otherwise that she didn't side for, uh, for labor. Well, that's that, in one case, and we already explained that there was a much more nuanced reason behind why that was the case. And I am cutting a clip of that today, I promise. I've been saying I'm cutting clips, and today is clip-cutting day. So I, there will definitely be some new clips coming out this week. Tomorrow is the news wrap-up. What are you going to be discussing tomorrow, Pascal? 
I think I'm going to have to be forced to talk about Katanji Brown Jackson. We're going to take a deeper dive. I think so. Well, thank you guys for joining us. We will see you guys tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Dr. Claw, do you have any closing comments? Dr. Claw, you got the jump, man? Yeah, um, I, I thought that was a, I thought that was a, 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 a great response, and that's how I was thinking about how Jackson's confirmation is being sold versus what her politics actually is, and you know it's a, it's kind of a big problem I think in general, not just with black politicians, but in general when we're talking politics in this country, the policy gets left out and it's all like wrapped up into this um, identitarian stuff. But um, I guess uh, I guess the thing that was striking to me about Thomas was his journey. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he was apparently rejected for being a you know a dark skinned Geechee from the South, from Savannah. You know, well, I, I you get the class, the class uh, element. It's not just being dark skinned from the South. Yeah, and he was rejected by the black elite, mm -hmm. Correct. not the you know not the, the white folks. But it's interesting to see him go from that point and being part of a black nationalist like group on college and everything, and then turn into what he is. And that's kind of like, you know, you think people like Clarence Thomas always were like, you know, what they are today. Um, but there's a journey there that I find very interesting. And, you know, it makes me wonder, well, if in the future, will we see Dr. Umar be on somebody's <laughs> television talking about, you know, talking the same, like, uh, you know, cultural war stuff that you hear from <laughs> the likes of uh, uh, Clarence Thomas and, and so on and so forth. That would be very interesting to see. Hey, Dr. Thank Claude, you, man, guys. thank you for the great questions. Thank you for your dedication to the show. Thank you for being a patron. And keep rocking with us, man. Make those clips, man. You you, you get the gold clips, man. What's up? And, and also, thank you for checking out the sports show uh, on Monday. We got a lot to talk about. The NFL is on fire right now, so we got a lot to talk about. And, and college basketball. So it's going to be nuts Monday. Are you still there? I think he's gone. I think we lost Dr. Claw. Yep, yep, yeah. Oh, shit. Thank Hold you, on. Dr. Claw. Let's see. Let's, uh, we have a here. Shout out to, on your left, June Shirley. And, of course, the clip master, Dr. Claw. Thank you, guys. <laughs> for calling and being a part of the Mile Mile Hour. This is fun to do. I love the call-ins. I believe we will be doing call-ins um, tomorrow. Are you ready to do tomorrow call-ins, Pascal? On, in the Patreon in the Patreon section? Oh, always in the Patreon. Oh, yeah. Always in the Patreon section. We can make that happen. Um, and maybe even Tuesday we'll do a call in with uh, with Cedric Johnson because my my daughter will be here with me. So we can do it all in house. M. Toussaint, thank you very much for helping us out with the call screening. Thank you, everybody, for for watching the show. And this will be going out in about a half hour for all the non patrons that can't participate. Thank you, guys. Anything, any last words, Pascal Robert? Please make sure we don't lose this show. <laughs> it's already streaming. We're fine. They said they fixed the problem. But we, yeah, but we know we, but we didn't get back. Yeah. I'm not very happy about that. But on that note, we are out. If I tell any secrets of the Mao Mao, this oath will kill me. If I am called in the night and refuse to come, this oath will kill me. If I see anyone steal white man's property, I must help him. I must hide what he gives me and say nothing, or this oath will kill me. The whole system in this country, the economic system, is such that uh, jobs are scarce. Automation is limiting jobs. It's, it's, it's decreasing jobs. And uh, if autom as automation eliminates the job opportunities, legislation will not create job opportunities. All it will do is bring about friction and hostility between the two races. You, 
you see, there will be no uh, progressive revival if black uh, folks are not deeply involved in it. I will obey all orders of the Mau Mau, or this oath will kill me.